All right, let's all stand in reverence to the reading of God's word. Uh, Psalm 133, it said, Behold, and how good, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even the Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the, the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Now turn with me if you have your Bible to John chapter number 17. And look, if you will, uh, down about verse number 20. And I'll just read two verses and then we'll go to Ephesians 4 and I'll finish. But it says, neither... Pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may be one, Father, excuse me, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Notice that. And that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so, but he, he prayed, let, let's be, let them be one. Now, go to Ephesians 4. Let me give you a couple of verses. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse number 3. Notice what it says. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now for this little while tonight, I want to preach to you on the subject that God has laid on my heart. I believe it's the Holy Spirit because I heard about some things that happened in Sunday school class this morning. I want to preach to you on the subject of unity. And I want to talk to you about what happens when people are united under, uh, under one purpose. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to be in this place tonight. I thank you, God, for all that you've done. I thank you for the sweetness and the closeness of your spirit. If there ever was a time when I needed to feel that, it was tonight. And I pray now, God, that you would touch the hearts of your people, that you'd bind us together in unity, that we'd be of one, one accord, we'd be of one mind. God, that we'd be, a, uh, a Lord, that as we pray, that our prayers are sent up to heaven, they'd be as the prayers of one man united together, that we'd be united together in one purpose, the, the purpose of reaching the loss for Jesus Christ. God, help us tonight. We might be what you'd have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Now, I want to talk to you tonight for just a little while about something that God desires for his people and yet demands of his people. And it's the one thing that Satan fears and works to undo. And, and it's something for which Jesus prayed before he went to the cross. And it's one thing that will convince the people that the church has something the world doesn't have. Now, what I want to talk to you tonight about is the subject of unity. And, and I, uh, let me make it uh, plain tonight what I'm talking about when I talk about unity. Now, when I talk about unity, I'm not talking about union. Uh, when you're in union with somebody, that just means that you're united uh, or bonded with someone under a common bond. And I'm not talking about uniformity. I'm not talking about everybody acts alike and everybody looks alike and everybody Everybody sounds alike and everybody thinks alike. Now, some people have the idea that that's unity, but it's not. And, and when I talk about unity, I'm not talking about unanimity. Now, you say, preacher, what's that? Well, there's no place on earth where everybody agrees on everything all the time. Amen. Can I get an amen right there? There's no place like that. And so I, that's not what I'm talking about. I wanna, that, and I want to talk to you about the subject of unity. And I, I, I heard about a lawyer who, uh, and a psychologist who were talking and, at, at a party. And the lawyer said, you and your wife seem to get along very well. 
do you ever have differences? And he said, oh, yes, the psychologist said, said, we have a lot of differences quite often, but we get over them quick. And the lawyer said, really, what do you do? He said, well, I just don't tell her about them. Amen. <laughs> Nevertheless, you'll get that when you get home. Amen. You'll, you'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning. No way. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we might not always have unanimity. We might not always agree about everything all the time, but we can, we can still have unity. And by unity, I mean a oneness. I, I believe that a Satan's strategy to destroy the church is divide and conquer. And, and, and what he would like for us to, for, to do more than anything else is split us all up, get us all, get us all divided. I have one little group over here and one little group over there and, and, and everybody going in a different direction because that's the number one strategy <laughs> that he has, divide and conquer. And, and the devil is, but let me say this, are you listening? The devil is no match for a unified church. And, and, and it doesn't matter what size the church is. It doesn't matter how many members it is, has or how big its budget is or how many buildings it has. It can be defeated member by member. You see, Satan's motive is division, his method is deception, and his mission is destruction. And I want to tell you, I'll get a little bit personal. If he can, he wants to destroy the big bottom missionary Baptist church. And, and if he does, he'll do it one member at a time. And, he'll, and he would love nothing better than to deceive us so that he could divide us and destroy us. Amen. And, and Satan cannot defeat a unified church. Now, every flank is covered. Do you realize that even the gates of hell cannot prevail against us? If we're united, the Bible said, you remember what Jesus said? Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And he was talking about the truth that Peter gave. Remember, he said, who do men say that I am? And he said, uh, some say that you're Elias and some Jeremiah's. And, so, and he said, well, who do you say that I am? And he said, I, I, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed art thou Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And he said, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And today, I want to tell you, when he builds his church, a united church can stand against the gates of hell, a united in, the love, in its love for Jesus, united in its love for one another. And now I want to ask you a question. Whose job is it to protect the unity of the church? Now I got something I want to tell you. Number one, and listen to me. The answer is every member. Amen. Every member. It's your job and it's my job to protect the unity of the church. And, and in Ephesians 4 and 3, Paul was speaking to every member in the church when he said, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And so I want to share with you what God expects us to do as members in this matter of preserving and protecting the unity of the church. And if you're here today, let me just say this. We don't need to have cliques. We don't need to have this little group and that little group. We need to be one great big group, amen? United under one cause. And so when I talk about unity tonight, that's what I'm talking about, a oneness. But let me talk to you, number one. Let me say to you, in preserving and protecting the unity of the church, he wants us, number one, to exhibit our unity to the world. Now, when I read to you the text in John chapter number 17, it's a beautiful thing when... Don't you think it's a beautiful thing when people can come together and get along, amen? And the most beautiful prayer that Jesus ever prayed was found in John chapter 17, and it said, and I read the verse to you, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now, now the Lord prayed that, that, that we would be one. And he prayed that we'd be one like the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And now when we think about that, often we think about the Trinity. And that, that, listen, when you think about God, God is a Trinity. A God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But you have to remember this. While there is a, he has a, a, a his personality is three. He's a Trinity. He's also unity. There is only one God. 
And that God exists in three separate and distinct personalities. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Hey, we get a misconception in our mind when we think about, sometimes we think of, of it as triunity. Well, we don't, we don't have three gods. We just have one God that exists in three separate and distinct personalities. And, and God is a perfect unity. And, and that's why this harmony and this unity grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost cannot and will not work in a church that's divided. The L. Moody said it like this. He said, I have never known the Spirit to work where the Lord's people are divided. Now, twice in his prayer, he says that the world may know. And, 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 and the greatest advertisement for the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a billboard. By the way, I'm not saying it because we put up a billboard, by the way. Amen. You got it, brother. I'm going to say it flat out. But the greatest advertisement is not a billboard. It's not a newspaper. It's not a television commercial. It's not on the radio. The greatest advertisement uh, that is a unified church that glorifies the Lord. Jesus is in all that it does. And you've heard it said that there's strength in numbers, but not necessarily. You see, only if those numbers are united and only if those numbers are unified. And, and tonight, hey, the better... <laughs> Do you know when, <laughs> if churches are not united and they start, now by the way, I don't know why God laid it, well, I got a glimmer, but I don't know exactly why God laid this on my heart. I, as far as I know, there ain't no fussing and fighting going on, and if there is, I really don't want to know nothing about it anyway, amen. amen. But I, I'm going to tell you this. When God's people start fussing and fighting and feuding and they're going off in every direction, you realize that when that happens, that there's people out there that know about it before we make it to the back door. <laughs> and if they don't know about it, some of y'all call them up and tell them about it. I know what I'm talking about. And, and that, that does great damage to the church. And the cause of Christ. It's when we're united that the world looks at us and says, listen, there's, them people got something real. Them people have something that we don't have. Because even in the midst of their diversity, and I'm going to get on this again in a minute. Even in the midst of that diversity and in all of their differences, they hang together when they're going against tough. They don't go splitting off everywhere and running around like a crazy person. They hang together. Amen. Amen. And, that's, and that's when God's glorified. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to have a oneness. He wants us to have a unity. And he wants us to exhibit unity to the world because uh, uh, when, you, when you think about it, uh, you, there's no strength in numbers unless those numbers are united. You know, do you realize this? Uh, one brick by itself is worthless. That's right. But you take a lot of bricks and put them together, they make a wall. Not only that, one shingle's worthless. But you take a lot of shingles and put them together and they make a roof. Hey, one link in it, one uh, one link is in a chain is worthless. But you put a, you put a bunch of links together, they become a chain, and and that's exactly what God wants out of us. When we're united, we're strong, and and when we're united, the world looks at us and says uh, and believes that geez, there's really something to this thing called Christianity, and there must be something real about this man called Jesus and the thing called salvation, and we must be united and exhibit that unity to the world. Amen. Hey, I read a story about an Ivy League professor who heard about a, a live dinosaur in, in South American rainforest. And so he, he launched an expedition to go down and find the dinosaur. And after several weeks, he stumbled up a little, a little man wearing a loincloth. And he's standing over top of a 300-foot dinosaur. He said, did you kill this? And he said, yes, I did. He said, how did you kill it? He said, I killed it with my club. The, the, the professor was amazed and he said, how big is your club? And he said, about 400 members. <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> you'll get it after. And listen, I'll tell you what, when you have a church united, it's a mighty club in the hand of the Lord to destroy and defeat the deceptive, divisive ways of the devil. Amen. And, but number one, he wants us to exhibit that unity. To the world, but number two, he, want, he expects us to express our unity in the church. 
Now, it don't just need to be something we talk about. It needs to be real. And, and why should we come together and work together? Well, first of all, I want to talk to you about, that little, about a little word called a family. Hey, if you read Psalm 133 with me, the psalm speaks and it says how, how beautiful it is for brethren. Now, that's exactly what a church is. And by the way, brethren is a family term. You, you don't, I don't know if you realize, I, mean, I remember going to a lady one time and I just uh, started as the pastor of a new church and I, I dressed her, I called her by her last name and talk, called her sister. I'll just, I'll just say it out loud. I called her Sister Gray. And she seemed to be offended when I said it to her. I didn't call her by her first name. I just called her sister. And, and finally her husband said to her, well, don't you believe that's right? Aren't you his sister? <laughs> and she said, well, I guess I am. And, and I don't know if, <laughs> by the way, I'm, I'm still not convinced, but anyhow. <laughs> Shh. Yeah, I'll, 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 anyway. But nevertheless, the church is a family. And, and, and we're the family of God. And, 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 and so we ought to act like family members. Do you, know, do you realize this? Families don't always agree. But when it comes down to it, they hang together. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, I found out one thing. The families might be in a fight, but if you walk up on a family in a fight, you better stay out of it. Because right. you stick your nose in that and you're going to get beat up because the next thing they're going to do is turn on you. Amen. Amen. And, and families don't always agree, but I'll tell you what, they always stand up for one another and they always stick together and we might, we might disagree. <laughs> we might disagree, but we ought to always hang together, amen? And we ought to exhibit our unity in the church and we ought to act like a family. If we call each other brother and sister, we ought to act like brothers and sisters, amen? We ought to act like, I told, I told Brother Mark before the church, we're back, I was talking to him for a minute. And I said, you know, this is the only family I got now. All the others died off. And for 16 years almost, I've stood behind this pulpit every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and every Wednesday. I've stood by your bedside. I've stood by you when you, the dearest in the world to you was dying. I've stood by the graveside. I've stood with you in the sick room. I, I've stood by you. And listen, I, would, I, I, want, I told Brother Mark, I want to keep standing by you. <laughs> because why? Because I take it seriously. I love you. you. You ever wonder why the pastor gets all messed up every time people start getting sick and serious things start to happen? Because listen, I take that on me serious. Sometimes you'll only go through that once in your lifetime, but I'll go through it hundreds of times because you are a part of my family, a great big extended family, and I take it seriously. And, and I, you ought to take it seriously. Yeah, go ahead and disagree go, if you have to. That's good preaching, brother. But don't be disagreeable all the time. Amen. Amen. Right. <laughs> and, and we ought to exhibit that unity in the church. The first word I want, you, I want you to see is the word family. But the second word I'd like for you to see is the word focus. Now I say, preacher, well, Romans 14, 19 says, let us follow after the things that make for peace. Now, when you look at it, the word follow after, the phrase means to focus on. And, and, it, and we need to focus on the things that make peace and, and, and the things that we have in common, not our differences that divide us. And we need to stay focused on what matters most. Conflict is usually a sign that we lose our focus about what's important. You know, you know every time I've ever seen a major uproar, you know what happens is we get our eyes off of what's important and get it all on something that's not important and you major on minors and when you begin to major on minors, you can you, you just mark it down. And when you get your eyes off of the most important thing and get it on something that is not important, there's going to be a problem every time. And the most important thing that we'll ever do is win lost souls to Jesus Christ. I may not always get my way and you may not always get your way, but we need to come together as one and do everything that we do for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. Amen. And you see, 
We need to exhibit that in the church. We need to get our focus on, on, what, it, on, on what it ought to be on. And conflict is usually a sign that the focus of the church has shifted to something less important. And we should focus on majors. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3, it says we should endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now when it says endeavor, it means it's something that you have to work on. It's something that you have to work at. You have to stay at it. And not let, and, and when he talks about the bond of peace, our, our, we're in the family of God, but our focus ought to be to bring peace, not to bring war, not to bring division, not to bring schism into the church. And, and, and if you read chapter four of Ephesians, you'll find it gives us the grounds for unity. Do you realize that there's one body and that's the church? And there's one spirit and that's the Holy Spirit. And there's one Lord and that's Jesus Christ. And there's one faith. And when it says that, that, that may, there's one revealed body of truth. There's one baptism. And I believe when it says one baptism, it's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's one God and there's one Father over all. And, we, and when we focus on personalities and when we focus on preferences, uh, I'll tell you what happens. Uh, our, our methods, it always divides us and division is always what happens happens and God wants us to express unity in the church. He wants us to be a family and he wants to focus upon those things that bring peace. Amen. Amen. And so God wants us to exhibit unity to the world. Number two, God wants us to express unity in the church. Let me give you the third thing I want to say to you tonight. That God wants us to exemplify unity in our life. Now he said and one of the reasons I always like to read Psalm 133 when I preach on the subject of unity is there's some beautiful pictures there. And he said there, there are two examples of unity. He said, number one, it's like oil. Boy, every time I read that, he, he talks, I read the verse that says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Now, when I read the expression, it's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even, excuse me, upon the beard, even to Aaron's beard that uh, went down to the skirts of his garments. I think about how that Aaron was, he was anointed to be the priest over all of Israel. And man, they came out to anointing that day and they took the precious oil and they began to pour it on Aaron's head. Now, by the way, when we anoint people, we get a little bit on the tip of our finger, the tip of our thumb, and we put a little bit right there. And by, probably by the time five or six deacons pass by in the pastor, you got a little bit maybe running down a trickle on your forehead. Well, that wasn't the way they did it back in when they, when they anointed Aaron. I mean, when they started pouring it on, they poured it on. I mean, it reached, it went from the top of his head down to, uh, and it ran down his beard. And when it got on his beard, it ran down his clothes and, and it went down all the way to the hem of the skirt of his garment until Aaron was totally covered in the precious oil, anointing oil uh, that well, of the day. Now, when you look, you'll find that oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Hey, I was going to preach and one of these days pretty soon, I, I, can't, I can't hit it very quick because I preached not too long ago on the midnight cry. But but you notice that in Matthew 25, the first pictures of, of 10 virgins and five were wise and five were foolish. And the five that were wise brought their vessel and they brought oil. But the five that were foolish brought their vessels, but they brought no oil. And the oil in that parable is a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God here in this passage. And I believe that when you talk about Aaron, you're talking about precious oil. You're talking, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit of God. And that anointing oil uh, in the Bible is, is, is a picture of, of God. God's spirit. And it's the spirit of God that's the source of our power as a Christian. But have you ever thought about this? It's the, also the source of our unity. Amen. You say, now preacher, how can you take people that are all different? By the way, in this church, there's diversity. There's all kinds of, hey, you know what? Every one of us is different. There's not one of us the same. We all have different personalities. We all have different likes and different dislikes. What pleases me might not please you. And, but, and there's diversity. Every one of us, God created us that way. And by the way, that was by his power and by his design. And, and it's not, hey, do you know what? I don't think it's bad because everybody in here is not like me. Bless God. Now my wife, will, I'll get a big hearty amen and a shout on this. It's a good thing everybody's not like me. 
Because what a, what, a, what a world it would be if everybody was like afraid Christian. We're all different. But I'll tell you what God does. God takes the precious oil of the Holy Spirit of God and he anoints us as a church and he takes diversity, every one of us being different and out of diversity he brings unity. When that breath, blessed oil, the Holy Spirit of God begins to flow, I'll tell you what, when, if you yield yourself to the Holy Spirit of God, I'll tell you one thing that'll be present in the church, there'll be unity. There'll be unity. There'll be no division. There'll be no schism because, every, because where the Holy Spirit is preeminent and where the Holy Spirit is honored and where the Holy Spirit of God leads, I'll tell you what happens, there's unity among God's people. We might not all always be alike and we might not always agree but I'll tell you what will happen we'll always hang together when it comes down to it because the Holy Spirit of God if we yield to him always produces unity it starts with man I think about O'Hare and standing out there it started on his head it ran down to his beard it ran down on his garment even to the skirts of the hem of his garment and finally it covered the whole body and when the Spirit of God begin, comes on the scene and begins to anoint those that are in this place I'll tell you what will be resident here there'll be unity in the hearts of God's people. Amen. Amen. And, and so the first picture is a picture of the anointing oil. Only God can take people that are different and bring them together under one banner. He said in him there's neither Jew nor Greek there's neither Jew nor Gentile bond nor free. We're all one in the body of Christ which is the church. But number two not only is it like Unity like <laughs> anointing oil. But unity is like refreshing dew. Now when you read the text, I, the next verse says, verse 3, as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon uh, uh, the mountains of Zion. Now in the hot Mediterranean climate, dew is a, a vital part to plant life and it's very dry. <laughs> By the way, let me stop right there. Have you ever been where it was very dry? I've been there. I took a deacon of mine. I won't, I won't tell any stories. It's a place I used to, uh, and I was in a place where I used to pastor. And, and I went over there and I said, we, he, he drove with me in the car. And I said to him, I said, well, what'd you think, deacon? He said, well, I'll hate to tell you, but that's the deadest place I was ever in. <laughs> I said, well, why you say that? He said, well, I was never only in any churches, but the church is on Campbell's Creek, but that's the deadest place I was ever in. And I've been in dry places. But I want to tell you, there was no irrigation in that Mediterranean climate and they were watered by the dew. And when you think about that, dew made the land green. And it was dew that made the land fruitful. And it was dew that made the land fertile. And it was dew that made the land productive. And what God does for the land, well, does for the land with dew, he does for the church with unity. Hey, listen, uh, if the church is united, it's just like dew in the desert. It comes on and, 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 and the church becomes fertile and the church becomes productive and the church becomes uh, 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 fruitful. And, and listen, that's what unity does for the church. Oh, amen. I want to close tonight with, a, with an illustration I found several years ago. I may have used it in another sermon. Many years ago, a naturalist began studying the habits of Canadian geese. And studying, he, he was studying why did they always fly in a V formation? And he discovered why they fly that way. Research revealed that each bird flaps its wings and when it does, it creates an uplift for the bird behind it. And, 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 for, and, and flying in a V formation, the whole flock has a 70% greater uh, flying range than if it flies on its own. And, and that should be a lesson to us. When people have a common goal of following God's will and obeying God's word, are you listening? They can go further, quicker, and have more success than traveling alone. Amen. Now what, and they also discover something else. They discover that when a goose falls out of the formation, it suddenly feels the drag going on. And when it feels the drag, it suddenly gets back into formation. Have you ever been out there and saw them things come over in a V formation going, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> by, the, by the way, that's for a reason. 
and, and, and that, that old goose will fall out and he'll fly in the front and he'll, he'll be the one taking all the wind friction and he'll fly there for a little while and then all of a sudden he'll fall out and one will take his place and he'll drop off here and he gets a little rest and they keep, they keep coming off and they keep flying back and they do that. Now, here, are you listening to me? Now, I'm going, I, that, I, there's a method to this madness. So if we have the sense that God gave a goose, Amen. are you listening? Amen. We'll stay in formation and we'll stay on course headed in the same direction. By ourselves we're limited and, and we can't do anything alone for God. And, and together we're, we're unlimited on what we can achieve. Hey, there's nothing that's too hard. There's nothing that's impossible for a united church. And united we stand. Are you listening? And divided we fall. And it's up to you. Whose job is unity? It's the job of every member. It's my job. And it's your job. And there's some big things coming up in the future. And the only way that we're ever going to get it all done is to stand united with a common goal Only then can we get the job done. Amen. Bow your heads with me.